Thanks, guys. Uh, I'm Ben from Global Core, and I've put a bunch of links from this talk actually up on my Twitter account there. If you want to follow that, it's also some of them retweeted at a Global Core company. Uh, th this whole presentation is there, actually. It's a PDF. You can download it, and the links are in there. Um, so at Global Core, we create digital experiences for physical spaces like trade shows, museums, retail environments, um, <coughs> and events. And today, I'm specifically going to be talking about using VR in physical spaces. <coughs> and just to get a bit of a poll to try to figure out who is here and kind of what different types of people, I'm wondering how many people are uh, students in the audience. Okay. What about VR developers? You guys are working on stuff. Okay. Uh, agency people, because that's a type of person. Okay, um, and uh, I guess VR enthusiasts, probably a fair bit, and I guess filmmaker is kind of the last thing that comes to mind. Got a few. All right, I don't know if I missed anyone there, but um, this, this talk is really, I mean, it's aimed at everybody, but, but it's on best practices, so I think it's going to be particularly relevant to agency people and people who are working to develop VR experiences, um, especially if you haven't done them before, because this is really about what we learned sort of on the way. <coughs> um, at Global Core, we're all about engagement. This is our big thing, to, to be engaged. Uh, our, like, we want our end user of our experiences to be engaged in the experience so that we can communicate them to them. That, that's basically our service that we're offering, we're trying to create like an attraction, bring them into the exhibit, engage them, and then communicate them to them. Um, at the same time, though, throughout the process of building these experiences, we want to engage our client in the process and make sure they're really engaged in developing with us to make sure they get what they want. And on top of that, we want to make sure that our entire team at Global Core is fully engaged in their work, just so it, we're going to get the best work out of them and it's going to be a, a good place to work. So in general, all in all, if we can make the world a more engaged place, then we're doing our job. Um, so, in order to do that, our strategy is around using emerging technologies and to use them in creative ways. <laughs> and this was really the core of the company from the very beginning. Our company is about 11 years old. The business was based around this idea that technology changes fast. And it was an observation back in the early days of web development. We are building websites and web applications and noticing how we were constantly learning a new technology every like a few months, it was a new programming language, a new framework, a whole new way to do things. <coughs> and we saw that insight as where our business was, was to be able to provide the service to evolve around that constantly changing scenario <coughs> and to continually provide the power of the new to our clients to use that to attract, attract and engage people. <coughs> so it, this was more or less our evolution. Um, started out in web design, building web apps and, and flash apps and uh, web applications and, and realized that we could actually use those same technologies in touchscreen development. So uh, some exhibits and events, 50-inch 50 50 uh, touchscreens were kind of our main thing, which are actually just flash sites. Um, but people and clients wanted those things to be bigger and bigger, and, and that moved into developing large format multi-touch walls, like 20-foot walls in Saudi Arabia and Dubai and Abu Dhabi and such. Ask me about that later. <coughs> um, and tables for museums. When the iPhone came out and the app stores, um, that was the new platform to work with, so we added mobile phone and tablet development into our capabilities. <coughs> and then once we started realizing the benefits of game-based experiences and raising that level engage of engagement, that became a real core focus for us about three or four years ago. <coughs> um, it was just uncomparable. Like the stuff we had been doing in the exhibits, uh, showcasing clients' products and stuff and such, w once we added this game layer in, we realized how intensely, uh, like how intensely we could increase that engagement level. And you can just see that in people's faces because of all the game psychology and game mechanics that get incorporated. Um, that, that insight led to uh, our, us developing 3D game engine capability, <coughs> and then, which is mostly like Unity development. And from there, a really quick jump into VR. 
technology standpoint, that's quite a, like a simple leap. And the big thing is that throughout this, we weren't just replacing technologies and moving from one to the next, we were adding on. So that now at, at this point, um, one of our typical Global Core projects would be a, a VR experience that was tied into a nearby multi-touch, large format multi-touch wall that was probably controlled by mobile tablets or interacted with and was game-based, built in a 3D engine, all backed by web social services and uh, CMS systems and lead retrieval registration. Um, this talk mainly is about our newest addition to the tool belt, tool belt uh, virtual reality. And, and the thing about this and how it fits into the first part that I was saying was that I, I just have never experienced something as engaging as virtual reality to date. So the, this lands right on the mark for us. It's just, it's so incredibly immersive, as you probably know if you've tried it. Um, but it, it's at a level that it's so immersive, it's actually dangerous. <laughs> in especially the event in exhibit space, which, which is why I'm here. So these are my pointers, and this talk is really about my pointers and, and what we've learned to try to avoid some of these dangers. <coughs> um, source cred material comes from or at least in this presentation, a number of different places. One, we were out at Oculus Connect. A few people in the room for sure were out there with us. Um, I was in LA <coughs> about a month and a half ago. At the same time, the Proto Awards were basically the day before Oculus Connect where they were giving out the Proto VR Award. Kaleidoscope Film Festival in Toronto not too long ago, providing a pretty good like range of different types of experiences. Our projects in the past, including Paper Dude VR, Power Cube VR, Graffiti VR, as well as some uh, more recent stuff that's kind of happened in the community in Toronto, specifically Toronto VR, in a, an event that even uh, was basically last week, uh, the Oculus edition of the event. <coughs> so at, uh, at Oculus Connect, the big thing uh, one of the bigger elements was Mark Zuckerberg coming out on stage and explaining to everybody why he was excited about VR and why he purchased Oculus in the first place for $2 billion from a 21-year-old, um, <coughs> which is crazy. Uh, he said that he went down to visit the Oculus team and he noticed that, or he quickly realized that this was not something that was coming. This was something that was here now. And... There is 250 million console users out in the world, and that, that's a big number, and that's a big market, and that's what they wanted, and that's what they're going after right away. So that's their big focus, um, and, and they're chasing that like uh, very specifically. Besides that, though, there's a long list of all the other applications that VR can be used for, obviously, and one of which is experiential marketing, which is where we're at. <coughs> This slide, you will see a lot. This was also like in uh, Tom's talk there, <coughs> just about the coming <coughs> uh, potential of VR and, and looking at as big as a $150 billion industry over the next, or by 2020. And even by just the end of next year, they're saying between AR and VR together, it's about uh, gonna be pretty close to a billion, which is significant. <coughs> and one of the biggest opportunities here, and this is probably mostly relevant for all you guys and why I think people should really take notice is that the current app stores with all these headsets coming online like the Samsung Gear that's coming out or came out in November in the States, sold out, uh, coming out this month in Canada, um, at the Oculus Rift commercial version coming out in January and the HTC headset they're all coming online and the app stores are, are practically empty. But, so you, we're at this like early point in the history which is very similar to when the iPhone first came out where there's really not much on the store. So that, that's a huge opportunity. Um, and yeah, the fact that this headset's only $99 is gonna drive a lot of, uh, a lot of people <laughs> to purchase it out of the gates. This is a, a homework question. I put this up on my Twitter feed 
I'm trying to figure out how many Samsung Gear VR headsets have been sold. It's not really clearly apparent. If you like, do some Google searching, I have a, like a Quora question or someone else has asked it, I've kind of like backed it. Um, if you guys want to do some digging around, that's a really great number for you to know if you're going to be like, thinking about developing VR content. Um, you need to know what the market size is right now and uh, yeah, it'd be worth figuring out that number because you're going to need it in your pitches. <coughs> Um, I mentioned Toronto VR. This happens once a month. Uh, Stefan, who organizes it, is giving a talk today. This thing, we host it actually at our office, usually the first Tuesday in every month, and it is growing really quickly. Um, this last one that was last week, uh, we had over 200 people show up. That was not unrelated to the fact that Oculus was actually there doing uh, demos of their, their new touch controllers. That's you. Um, <coughs> and uh, so, I mean, definitely come check that out. If you haven't, you can sign up on the Toronto.com meetup or meetup.com slash Toronto VR. We have a HTC headset down there. It's not something that's easy to get access to, so you can always come check that out. But more importantly, someone took this photo when I was talking to one of the Oculus guys, and he s told me a few things that I found really interesting that relate to this cross-market um, between the app stores and the, this like B2B stuff. So Global Core is mainly in the B2B world, creating experiential marketing events, um, opposed to actually creating products. But in my conversations with him, he did make it fairly clear that Oculus is very much focused right now on the app store releases. So, um, and he also mentioned that they highly curate, well, they curate the store fairly significantly. So pure advertising content, pure advertising experiences on the Oculus store very likely will not go through. That's a pretty um, key piece of information that, that I didn't know like more than a, a week before. <coughs> he mentioned that they recently turned down a Dos Equis experience, which was hanging out with the Dos Equis guy in a bar and chatting with him most interesting man in the world. And even the most interesting man in the world couldn't get through. So, um, yeah. You will see entertainment-based properties, but they're really being pitched and like sold as actual content in themselves. So that's, that's where you have to play. And he said, submit anything, like we'll try to work with you, but something to keep in mind, especially when you're pitching your clients, and this is back to the agency thing, like, you got to watch what you pitch, and hopefully I'm going to tell you more about watching what you pitch. Um, that might be one of them. It might not be so easy to get your ad concept onto the actual like gear or Oculus store. <coughs> so uh, best practices, we had to learn best practices the hard way because when we first started developing for VR, white papers didn't really exist yet, um, but now they do. So you can save yourself a lot of time just by going to the Oculus Best Practice website. I put a link there. It's, it's in my Twitter account. Um, but I found it also a handy way to kind of compare what we learned in the School of Hard Knocks versus what they actually have up there as a bit of a frame of reference. <coughs> um, this was our first teacher, Paper Dude VR. Did this about two years ago. This is a 30-second video to kind of show you <coughs> what the project was. Basically... We recreated Paperboy, the 80s cult classic video game, with a, an Oculus, at the time, DK1, a Wahoo Fitness power trainer connected by Bluetooth into the system to get your speed, the Kinect sensor out front to detect your arm motion so you can deliver your newspapers. <coughs> so what we learned there, sort of six, six key learnings. First one, this is the biggest thing for us, and this is actually where the whole paper dude concept came from, was as soon as we got our DK1 Kickstarter headset, we put it on in the Tusky, Tuscany demo and looked around, and it was amazing, and then we looked down and saw no body, and it just like broke the illusion right there. Um, so we rigged up the Kinect, and we put a character model in there, and we got the character skeleton, and looked around, and instantly significantly better. At the time, we had been 
uh, getting some crazy amount of incoming requests for bicycle-powered interactive experiences for some reason. Uh, and the idea just kind of like gelled that, well, why don't we recreate Paperboy and <coughs> use the Kinect thing? <coughs> um, but it, it is actually a very uh, significant issue, and it has to be overcome in design, and hopefully with the new touch controllers or the other uh, hand controls, some of the one ones that Tom was talking about, we can get around that, that fact fairly quickly. You need to beware of this frightening level of immersion. Um, <coughs> it's actually hard for people to kind of tell the difference sometimes between what's real and what's not, and we experienced that a lot with uh, Paper Dude. Namely, we'd have people on the bike, and they'd be throwing their papers, and they weren't paying attention, and that roadblock started coming at them, and they didn't know they could throw the paper and knock it over, and they panicked, and they'd jump off the bike. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to change our setup, make sure we had spotters like next to people, because, um, yeah, literally have had to catch people. Um, we try to be really clear about how to knock the thing over, don't be afraid, not real. <laughs> Horizon is key. That's like one of the worst ways, easiest ways to screw up your experience is if you like move the horizon line. Don't do that. We had that in our system because we originally let people move the bike around. If you like leaned your body, the bike would move over um, and possibly like move the world. And very quickly people came disoriented and they lost their sense of balance. And this was especially bad for Paper Dude because you're on a bike where you kind of need like balance in the first place. So again, people falling off the bike, not good. Um, this is particularly related to event-based stuff. There's a major need to be able to see the screen that people, um, what they're seeing, so that you can communicate with them while they're in there for a couple of reasons. One is a on the, the brand ambassador side of things um, and a kind of like training level, you can quickly see if someone's doing something wrong, like paper dude game, maybe they're throwing the newspapers too low you, and you can tell, you just say, raise your, he raise your head and they do and it fixes the issue. Also, it adds the kind of like spectacle for all the people waiting in line. They know what they're getting into. Um, they can make fun of their friends. It, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, we say practically essential. <coughs> there was a lineup at the Intel booth at CES that had an Oculus demo that was like a football field long and you couldn't actually see what the demo was. So it was a real gamble whether or not you were gonna wait in this line for like two hours to do something. Um, so I'd say very important. UI in the world, we made a big mistake originally about putting UI like attached to your head as a kind of the HUD heads-up display kind of technique um, that's just really not, not nice. It's, it's uh, not a good use of space. Put the UI in the world. In Paper Dude, we did that uh, down by the handlebars. If you look down, your, your numbers are just kind of like floating above your handlebars, your score and how many papers you have and, and such things. And finally, this one is the biggest one. <laughs> Accelerations and locomotion, uh, the, way, the biggest way to mess people up is by speeding up or slowing down too fast. We had this a lot, Paper Dude, at the end, that the bike just stopped. People like lurch forward, or, like lurch backwards, and, and uh, instantly feel sick. And, and in general, if you can avoid moving at all, that, that's currently pretty high up there in the Oculus best practice. There's actually a lot that you can still do without moving, and, and there's so much to explore in this space, and your probably best bet is to try to come up with a concept that doesn't need you to move. And I have a bit more on this part towards the end. <coughs> so at Paper Dude VR, you can check it out. That URL forwards you to our website. Again, the PDF online has links at the bottom. <coughs> Second project was actually a film-based project, um, Graffiti VR. We're showing it downstairs, the Google Cardboard experience. You can check it out on the second floor. It is a time-lapse, 360 stereographic film of graffiti artists, four of Toronto's top graffiti artists painting on transparent acrylic panels, uh, sort of like it's floating in space. This was made for Intel um, <coughs> to actually demonstrate one of their 
softwares they have, which translates an Android code base into native iOS. So we filmed the uh, <coughs> we filmed it in Toronto and took it to San Francisco. Which I'll show you in a sec. <coughs> Three of the kind of main learnings that we got from it was really around using 360 stereographic film, um, which is not really there yet. This is one of the biggest areas for development. Tom touched on it. <coughs> there is so much more to be done here to make this easy. You can't just go and buy a 360 camera or a stereographic. And there's other techniques that um, some guys in Toronto we're working with are really pushing hard to develop to kind of get around this. But it, it's not straightforward. It will become better quickly with the new like light field cameras coming out and that Google Jump setup and, and such. Um, but something to keep in mind, especially back to this pitching thing, like it, it's not a straightforward scenario. Um, <coughs> cardboard, uh, that as far as the brand marketing event space goes, is like a major win. It, it is a really amazing promotional giveaway item with one of the biggest reasons being that it is something that people can actually use after the fact. It's not you know, a pen or whatever to take home. There's a huge amount of content out on the app store, on the like, iOS and Play app stores for Cardboard VR now. Um, so it, people actually quite appreciate it. And it's fully brandable from companies like Dodo Case. And finally, positional sound is one of the other big things you notice, and it's a big Oculus uh, VR best practices. Make sure that you do not fix your audio to the person's head. If you like move your head and the audio sticks with you, it's a very odd experience. You have to make sure to put your audio out in the space. Even if it's a background track, it has to come from somewhere, so like up in the corner from a speaker. This is what the 360 cam setup looked like that we used. Uh, it's a rig of 12 GoPros. We did this, the film production part of this with the 1188 and Occupied VR. I think some of those guys are here. <coughs> um, pretty gnarly setup, lots of USB cables and fair bit of like card management and such things. Um, but th this is kind of, you know, up there in the state of how you do this stuff right now. <coughs> and a huge amount of time afterwards in stitching People looking for new careers, being a stitcher is a new thing. So, <laughs> not sure it's the best job, really. But <laughs> um, from that event, some shots from the film, which again you can see downstairs or up top. Uh, the graffiti artists from in Toronto are like, really amazing. Um, on the streets in San Francisco, they handed out 4,000 of these cardboard headsets that were branded Intel and Intel IDF, which was the event. And you can download it on the Android and, and App Store or Apple App Store. It's big thing to notice there: the difference. We got the Android app on the store in about two hours through the approval process. The iOS version took six weeks, or yeah, just over a month basically to get it up there. <coughs> um, one of the more significant or like crazy delay things that we noticed was. Um, while we threw all the, like, the actual approvals, we noticed a small bug in the app, so we made one line, code line change, and reposted it, and we had to wait an entire another week to get that one like, kind of line back through the store. So again, you gotta watch that in the pitch. <coughs> Some shot of what it looked like. Here's a quick video behind the scenes of us making it. Oh. Audio is. Almost essential. Wrong audio. <laughs> what audio is that? <laughs> It's my own laugh track for when I practice this presentation. <laughs> really? <laughs> okay, 
have no idea what's playing in my browser in the background here, but <laughs> anyway. <laughs> it's just music, so it's okay, but um, it's just footage back there, graffiti artists, uh, you know, kind of what the actual setup looked like. <coughs> um, not the best place to be for hours on end. The fumes are intense, but pretty cool to watch. <coughs> Part, uh, yeah, that's acrylic, transparent acrylic that's sort of suspended from the ceiling. And we brought some of these artists with us to San Francisco, so they actually repainted a bunch of it in the street and they built a, a 3D uh, wooden model. And then the second film, it's, it's actually three films. Second film takes place at night, and it's like a kind of light, light map projection show. And the third film is an interview with the developers, so that, that's kind of like the actual advertisement for, for the product is in the third one. Graffiti VR, you can download it, Google Play and App Store, and you can use your cardboard headsets to check it out. We may do more with it. Um, it's, it was for a client originally, but it's actually a property, so we may add some more kind of graffiti content as, as we go. <coughs> All right, uh, yeah, next section, one of the, the big areas of the best practices list, talk about controlling the avatar, and this is totally related to the how we solved the paper dude situation. We needed a way to do that, <coughs> and it's flowed into some of our other projects, but the main issue is that user can't see the input device while they have the headset on, so fairly straightforward. Because of that, you have to use familiar controllers. So, you know, Xbox style controller, most people kind of know how to do that. If you actually want to try to use a keyboard, you have to imagine they're going to make mistakes, probably not the best idea. You'd have to design around that. Um, but in most cases, strongly consider head movement for the actual control, uh, control input device. It's probably one of the most intuitive and sort of cheapest, easiest to get, to get out, of the, out of the box. <coughs> so that would be controlling the input selection with your gaze and maybe selecting by touching the headset in the case of the VR, Gear VR. This is a handy chart for you. <coughs> Separated the four main headsets and some of their benefits. First one, um, the Rift. The availability is probably going to be one of the bigger ones once it's out. It, there's going to be a lot of them. The Fidelity, it's got to be one of the best. And the user base, this thing's been around for so long, the user base is actually you know, quite large, and people that are into the various uh, app stores. And coming out hopefully in Q2, but uh, definitely in 2016, are the touch controllers, which make all the difference. <laughs> Samsung Gear VR, you can't beat the mobility. The fact that there's no wires, like the thing is extremely convenient. Um, not as high response rate, and, and you lose the kind of positional tracking stuff, but for a lot of things, is definitely going to do the job, and you have the handy trackpad on the side, so that's nice. HTC Vive, um, <coughs> uh, immersion level has got to be probably number one, the fact that you can free walk around a basically a 15-foot square, and yeah, hopefully people can try it down at our office. Uh, that That's pretty wild, <coughs> that you can move around a space and have the whole VR world around you not move at all. So the level of immersion has got right up there. Fidelity of totally compares Oculus, and it comes with the Vive controllers. Um, they're a lot bigger than touch controllers, maybe not as slick. We'll see what the final version looks like. They work well, but they're a little bit awkward. And you have to kind of hold them. The touch controllers can almost just sit on your hand. Finally, Microsoft HoloLens, obviously in the AR side of things, um, <coughs> Microsoft did a tour stop in our offices last month. They rented our office out to do this kind of private event, and so we got to actually try it out. I was pretty skeptical at first, um, but it, it is certainly impressive. Like The only downside to it I could see is the field of view is, is not huge, but it's not that small either. It's probably about that big. <coughs> and um, the most significant thing I noticed was that in the demo, they took advantage of using the physical area that we were standing in to project the interaction or the animations on. In this case, it was 
the wall cracking open and scorpions crawling out. And what I would have expected would be that this animation uh, looked like a semi-transparent thing projected against the wall, where it actually really erased the wall. There was no more wall there, and there was a crack in the wall, and you could look into the wall, and it's highly, highly convincing. So that, that's got to be the most impressive part about it. It's also completely untethered. Um, that thing's like a computer in itself, sort of like a supercomputer, has a holographic chip in it, whatever that means. <laughs> um, so like some next level technologies happening there. <coughs> Other alternative, invent a controller, which is what we did. Power cube, which is also here downstairs on the second floor. <coughs> Power Cube is a two-person, four-walled version of Tetris in 3D, where the controller is a custom-made cube called Power Cube. Inside the cube is a little Edison chip. Um, it's an entire Linux OS on a chip that is wireless and Bluetooth built into it. 90 degrees of freedom IMU on the bottom and to control the accelerometer, gyroscope position, uh, and then kind of battery at the bottom. And part of the reason we even chose to use this was that Intel's one of our clients, and if we use it, maybe they'd use it in one of their events, and they did, so that was good. This is what the event version of it looked like. Um, we originally did this at FITC, but later it upgraded it for the Intel version. You can see we've added some lights and some motors to control some haptics. And uh, here's some video from the actual event. Probably no audio. <coughs> this is a toy box demo built in Unreal. Oh. It was originally developed by the Touch team as a way to prototype here's new hardware way. features and drive. Let's close the browser down, maybe that'll do it. Welcome to Power Cube. Right. You must win to survive. Good luck. One of the key things about that cube is that it's really obvious how to control it. There's no just like big buttons or small buttons to deal with. It's just a big object. So using familiar devices, uh, maybe the same thing as saying using simple devices to control the experience. We had more of a party scenario set up at FTC than we do downstairs. It works well with disco balls and laser lights and an MC. A lot of high fives. The, uh, this is some shots of the close-ups of the touch controllers from Oculus Connect. <coughs> Things are going to be a lot easier once these come out. And the toy box demo probably being the most um, impressive thing that I saw at Oculus Connect. <coughs> So you put the headset on, and you have the touch controllers, and then you enter this room and realize there's someone else in the room with you, which was pretty amazing because they didn't mention that it was going to happen. So the guy started talking, and you think he's sort of like an AI guy at first, and then you realize he's probably a little smarter than he should be. Turns out he's a real guy, but he's in a different room, like down the hall. <coughs> um, yeah, so you can kind of, I mean, of all the many reasons, pretty good idea of why Facebook might be interested in this technology is that the social capability is extremely high. <coughs> uh, and I guess the other interesting thing to note is that <coughs> while you can't see the people's faces, their actual movements of their hands and their head and the subtle like tweaks is real. And that makes it feel so amazingly real. It's like you don't realize how much you just kind of move your head around 
um, but we can pick that up so it adds that extra level of immersion. Um, some tips to kind of avoid this cleanup in aisle three stuff. <laughs> Movement speed, if you're going to move, do it really slowly. And as an alternative, you can consider teleporting. So pick a location you want to go to and then fade out and appear there again. Um, we did that for a Samsung client. Recently, Samsung was opening a store at Sherwood Gardens and the store wasn't ready for the actual launch um, with all the other stores, so they had wanted to be able to show people still what it looked like. And we basically recreated the, what the store was going to look like and gave a couple options. One was like a really slow walkthrough, and the second one was the, the teleporting device. Um, however, back to one of the earlier points is you can do so much without actually moving the person through the space. And um, some of the best examples are out there right now, <coughs> such as Keep Talking, Nobody Explodes game, which is probably one of the best uses of, of VR I've seen yet that completely subverts this idea of VR being a, um, a isolating experience. It kind of is an isolating experience sometimes. That's what Tom talked about, but not this game because you have to play it with a person outside who has a paper manual trying to figure out how to defuse this bomb, and you have the headset on defusing the bomb. You don't move at all in that game. This game's probably going to be the Angry Birds of the iPhone scenario. It, it's such a fun party game. People will buy the headset just to have this game. Um, I Expect You to Die won the Proto Awards, many, many awards at the Proto Awards. You don't have to move in this game. It's like a, a really ironic, funny puzzle game. Bullet Cam was probably the main thing that people did it, or sorry, Bullet Train was probably the main thing that people did at Oculus Connect. They used a teleportation device, and uh, Tom mentioned the social VR uh, that Oculus has put out, which is in beta, but it's pretty wild. I tried it. We tried it recently a couple times, and you show up in a movie theater, and um, you talk to random strangers next to you. Some guy from Turkey was there, and another guy from Istanbul. So we hung out for a bit. <laughs> kind of awkward, but <laughs> I felt like I shouldn't be talking like while they were watching a movie, so I was like, sort of whispering to them. <laughs> Initializing simulation. <laughs> Oh, you can see like a little bit of video of a uh, bullet time there and the teleportation device the they've, they've done. The the enemy will be waiting. <laughs> Mob rule from the event standpoint, three main things that are very real to consider when you're designing these experiences. Sanitation is big. Like, it's pretty gross. CS, Samsung booth uh, last year, the lineup is like thousands of people long and one after the next, putting the headset on, taking off, putting it on, taking off, putting it on, taking off, and and I, I don't know, just like SARS was coming to mind or something, avian flu, I don't know. Um, so you need to be able to wipe it down. You need that brand ambassador there. You have to wipe the lenses every <coughs> single time. Um, that's like actual staffing that you have to consider. And throughput is probably the biggest thing. When you only when your experience is maybe two minutes long, you can only do it one at a time. You have to plan for that. And they did a pretty good job of this at Oculus connect in the Samsung um, room, they had like a hundred headsets, so they were getting people through. Same thing, the uh, Kaleidoscope Film Festival, um, <coughs> even though they had tons and tons of headsets, there were still lineups. And the bottom photos from uh, Connect as well, and, and those are basically filled with VR s rigs, which is maybe indicating where the trade show world that we kind of work in is actually going towards, sort of interesting. <coughs> so what's next? Wrap up here, like a little less than five minutes. Um, we are really focused on adding the kind of next capability to our, our list of evolution there. So we've been doing a lot of 3D scanning, the ability to get your own avatar in the experience or other avatars in the experience is, is Definitely intriguing um, to scan, head scan of Denis, creative director, Globacore, attached to a like, rigged animated character so that <coughs> you could get scanned and then play yourself in a video game down at the bottom. <coughs> and th this is 
you know, only to improve, and there's actually a couple companies in Toronto that, that we work with, we know they're doing a really good job of this. One uh, is called It's Me. They're focusing on a market that's much more of like a mall kiosk style thing where you walk into one of these metal contraptions, get scanned in about half a second, walk out again, and within minutes you have a, a full body 3D version of yourself. They actually did this to me yesterday and rigged it up for me, put a little video together. So, <laughs> it's me twerking, so. <coughs> uh, I mean, the fact that this was done in, like, in seconds and fully automated is pretty impressive. Obviously, there's still a, a distance to go here. <laughs> <coughs> okay. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, uh, quantum capture, guys from there are talking today, too like next level realism using DSL ca cameras and you know, a bit more of a manual process even though they're working to automate it. To be able to get like realistic, photorealistic people into the experiences is, is pretty amazing. You think about what you could do there and uh, we're talking to some people right now around this and, and uh, like professional af athletes and such things. So <coughs> in our uh, evolution that kind of tacks on to the end of it, 3D scanning, Companies constantly evolving. The next few months, you can look for us at a few different events. We're at CES, IEEE, with the four-player multiplayer game. Uh, Lexus, Auto Show, Circuit. We'll be in Toronto in February and some stuff for Toyota in March. And uh, yeah, closing, I had this issue with the Wired Magazine article many years ago that published this whole thing about how the universe is actually a massive computer and I didn't think that was fair. It's like, respect what came first. The computer is actually a little universe. <laughs> and they didn't print it. But uh, <laughs> I said it. I, I think it's just um, a nod to like the creative potential of the computer and what can be done. And with the VR, you start seeing all these things converge. And, and of all of the experiences I've done, this is probably the most intense from that. Mars is a real place. Download that on the App Store, and it's 3D stereographic imaging from Mars. Um, and I've seen these photos before, like online, wherever, NASA, newspapers, such, and they're pretty cool, impressive Mars landscape, like, wow. But when you put it on, and it's 3D, and you can look around, you suddenly realize that this is a real place, and this was a real photo taken by a real thing that we sent many thousands and thousands of miles into space to do that. Um, and that is like unbelievable. So it just kind of hit home and this like moved me. I would seriously suggest checking it out. <coughs> and uh, yeah, thank you.